Hello everyone, this is Paleo Nerd here, back with another creature profile. Yeah, it's been a while. <clears throat> this installment is what you might call a double feature, as I will be covering, well, double the normal amount of prehistoric animals, which is one. The featured animals in question are Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus, and while Spinosaurus was technically the only one featured on the poll, these two are so incredibly similar and so closely linked that I really couldn't think of a way to cover one without the other. In addition, Spinosaurus was one of the few animals specifically requested by commenters, the other being Olaphrosaurus, so that's why those two were in the poll. Anyway, Spinosaurus is quite a famous dino, yet also it is strangely a bit of an enigma in the paleontological community, and adding Sigilmosasaurus into the mix has only made things much more complicated. You may think you know Spinosaurus, but soon after this video you will begin to question everything you think you know about this animal. This is, this is what I will call the tale of two Spinos, and you'll see why soon enough. Before we start the tale, we need to know our characters, Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus. Both of these guys typically have one species, those being Spinosaurus aegypticus, or Egyptian spined lizard, and Sigilmosasaurus brevicolis, or short-necked Sigilmosa lizard. Although there is also Spinosaurus marocanus, or Moroccan spined lizard, which may be another species of Spinosaurus, a synonym of Spinosaurus aegypticus, or a synonym of Sigilmosasaurus. It's kind of iffy right now. Spinosaurus's generic name re refers to, well, the long spines on its back, which are the extended spinous processes of, processes of the animal's vertebrae, while the specific name of S. aegypticus refers to Egypt where it was found, while S. marocanus, if you count it as its own species, refers to Morocco where it was found. Sigilmosasaurus's generic name refers to the ancient city of Sigilmosa near this fossil site where it was found, while the specific name, Brevicolus, refers to the animal's relatively short, shortened neck vertebrae. These animals are known from four main fossil sites, the Baharia Formation in northern Egypt, the Alfus Formation in eastern Morocco, the Chanini member of the Ain el Gutar Formation in southern Tunisia, and the Akkar Formation in western Niger. Sorry if I butchered any of those. However, which sites contain Spinosaurus and which contain Sigilmosasaurus is not entirely certain, for reasons that I will explain later. Almost all these sites are dated to the Cenomanian Age of the Mid-Cretaceous, about 100 to 93.5 million years ago, although Chinini is dated from the Aptian to the Albion, about 115 to 109 million years ago, meaning either Spinosaurus or Sigilmosasaurus may have lived even earlier. There has also been a Spinosaur tooth which may have been dated to the Campanian, but this stuff is getting complicated enough as it is, so I'm just going to try and make this video as simple as humanly possible. What is known, at least somewhat, is the size of both genera. Both Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus are believed to be among the largest of their kind, although Sigilmosasaurus is currently believed to be larger, as while well, Spinosaurus is considered to reach a length of about 11 to 12 meters or 36 to 40 feet long, Sigilmosasaurus has been estimated at 15 meters or 50 feet long. It was these larger estimates which led to Spinosaurus being praised as the largest theropod ever, even bigger than T-Rex, because I guess the media doesn't give a shit about Sigilmosasaurus. 
However, while these two spinos may have been longer than T-Rex, they were actually lighter, with estimates typically ranging between 5 to 7 US tons, while the largest T-Rex specimen weighed 8 to 9 US tons. Since mass is the best way to define the size of an object and weight is directly related to mass, that means T-Rex is still the lar biggest terrestrial predator that we currently have on record to ever exist, and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. Back to the profile, and uh, believe me, this is where it starts to get complicated. In terms of discovery, Spinosaurus is the older of the two, two genera, with the first remains being discovered in 1912 by Richard Markgraf from the Baharia Formation in Western Egypt. The partial skeleton would later be described by the German paleontologist Ernst Stromer three years later in 1915 in an article where he named the animal Spinosaurus aegypticus. The holotype, which consisted, of a, which consisted of a lower jaw, teeth, multiple vertebrae, some with the iconic spines, and the gastralia, were, was kept in the Paleontological Museum in Munich, Germany, where they would meet an unexpected demise when the museum was destroyed during a British bombing raid of Munich on April 24th and 25th of 1944 during World War II. All of the fossils in the museum, including the holotype of Spinosaurus, as well as those for Carcharodontosaurus and Bahariosaurus, were completely vaporized, and all that remains of the fossils is a photo, as well as Stromer's drawings and descriptions of the fossils. Seashell Mosasaurus's story is much more recent and also a bit less tragic, as it was described a whole 81 years after Spinosaurus in 1996 by Canadian paleontologist Dale Russell based on remains from the Kem Kem beds in southern Morocco, which is part of the larger Alphos formation mentioned earlier. However, its validity was challenged almost immediately when Concordontosaurus vertebrae, similar to the holotype, were found in the same formation leading some to believe that Sigilmasasaurus was merely a junior synonym of Carcharodontosaurus. Subsequent studies began to poke holes in these original conclusions, and in 2013, Sigilmasasaurus was, co was confirmed to be a valid taxon. Then, in 2014, Nizar Ibrahim and his colleagues referred all Sigilmasasaurus specimens to Spinosaurus aegypticus, and in 2015, Sigilmasasaurus was redescribed and recovered as a valid genus, with Spinosaurus marocanus proposed as a synonym. In a recent 2018 study, many Spinosaurus fossils, including MSNM V4047, a fossil of the tip of the snout, were assigned to Sigilmasasaurus. And to this day, the debate continues as to which fossils belong to Spinosaurus and which belong to Sigilmasasaurus, and to whether Spinosaurus has two species or just one, and frankly, it's just chaotic. This entire debate is even more difficult to resolve because of how fragmentary the holotypes of both genera are. And the fact that the Spinosaurus holotype was destroyed means all we can use to compare with future fossils are sketches and photos, and there is evidence to suggest that Stromer's sketches are not entirely accurate. One of the prevailing ideas is that all specimens from Egypt are Spinosaurus, while Moroccan specimens belong to Sigilmasasaurus. This probably makes the most sense as having two similarly sized carnivores with similar diets in the same environment would be very problematic, so the two genera would likely be separated by location to avoid competition. But again, this can't be straight up confirmed with the information we have. Now we move on to a much simpler topic. Both 
Both Spinosaurus and Cedromosasaurus belong in the family Spinosauridae, which in turn is part of the superfamily Megalosauridea. And in a recent 2018 analysis, the two were placed in their own tribe, Spinosaurinae, which is within the subfamily Spinosaurinae. Thus, Spinosaurus and Cedromosasaurus are most closely related to, well, each other, but also to other Spinosaurines like Siamosaurus, Ichthyovenator, Irritator, and Oxalea. The appearance of Spinosaurus, or more accurately, reconstructions of the animal, has changed drastically since it was first discovered. As Stromer initially drew the animal more or less like T Rex or Allosaurus, but with a giant sail on its back, which would persist until about the early 2000s, when they started to take some inspiration from its relatives, and it basically became Baryonyx with a sail. Later, more remains, which may belong to either Spinosaurus or Sigilmosasaurus, were found, including a snout tip and crest which resulted in a design resembling that of planet dinosaurs designed for the animal. This design would become the status quo until a study in 2014 by Ibrahim et al., which would divide the paleontology community and piss off the Jurassic Park and Monsters Resurrected fanboys for all eternity. In that fateful study, Ibrahim and his colleagues concluded, based on fossil evidence of course, that Spinosaurus had much shorter legs than people thought, and thus new Spinosaurus was born. This new rendition almost immediately sparked a love-hate relationship with the general public. People who actually care about paleontology and scientific progress loved it while Jurassic Park fanboys and Austin Bros hated it and started whining about how they ruined Spinosaurus as if it's somehow the scientist's fault it looks like this. Anyway, the short hind legs of Spinosaurus led many scientists to conclude that Spinosaurus was a quadrupedal animal, walking on its knuckles like a gorilla to move around. However, others argued that the hands of Spinosaurus were not built to support the animal's weight and that its tail would have created enough of a counterbalance to allow the creature to walk comfortably in a bipedal stance. While others believe it may have alternated between quadrupedal and bipedal movement. So anyone still mad about Spino's new look, calm your titties, it's probably still bipedal. Sigilmosasaurus hasn't had as drastic an evolution in its appearance, having been described almost a century later. The most drastic change in its depiction being from a generic megalosauroid, although one looks like Sinotyrannus for some reason, to a full-fledged Spinosaur, which met with many depictions I've seen being based on the Spino depictions right before the 2014 paper, as well as those after the paper. However, one major difference between many sigil Mosasaurus depictions is whether or not it is shown with a sail, with some basically making it a sailless Spinosaurus, while others make the two genera look almost completely identical to the point that if you put the two alongside each other, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the two apart. Of course, which depiction of Sigilmosasaurus is correct without a spine or with a spine or without is not known at this time, as no confirmed fossils of Sigilmosasaurus include the vertebrae, which, at least in Spinosaurus, would have said spines. That being said, one of the defining features of both genera are, depending on which depictions of Sigilmosasaurus you agree with, the large sail on the back, which has evolved from being depicted as basically a half circle, to being much shorter, more flat on the top, and also curving inward near the middle or end of the sail. Another defining feature of these two are their incredibly thin, crocodile-like snouts with a signature notch near the front, and that little crest which kind of looks like if you strained out Cryolophosaurus's crest and rotated it sideways. This skull was also attached to an incredibly long neck, which is thought to be able to curve backwards like a pelican to allow the animal to strike its head forward rapidly to catch prey. 
Although it can't be confirmed with the current fossils, Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus also likely had a large claw on the first finger, like their close relative Baryonyx, which would have helped them to catch fish. Now, despite what awesome bros and 8 year olds who just watched Monsters Resurrected might tell you, Spinosaurus was not an apex predator that killed everything in its path, and neither was Sigilmosasaurus. In fact, this is really quite obvious if you know what to look for, as the teeth of Spinosaurus are straight, conical, and have less serrations on the teeth of, than the teeth of other theropods, meaning they couldn't really slash into prey. Their long, thin skulls were also too fragile to hold on to a struggling prey item, or a large struggling prey item, and both genera coexisted with other more efficient predators like Carcardontosaurus, which were much better at killing large dinosaurs. Instead, we have direct evidence that Spino and Sigil, or at least their relatives, would have feasted almost entirely on fish and other aquatic animals. First, the skulls of Spinosaurs are very similar to that of other fish eaters like gharials, certain types of conger eels, and even unanlagines. Second, the holotype specimen of Baryonyx, a close relative of Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus, was found to have the remains of the fish Sheenstia, as well as a juvenile Iguanodon. However, the Iguanodon was likely scavenged, so fish was probably the primary food source for Spinosaurus. There was also a pterosaur vertebrae found in Brazil with a tooth embedded into the bone which is believed to belong to the fellow Spinosaurine irritator, which suggests that Spinosaurs may have had a more diverse diet than previously thought. Yet again, could still be scavenging. Anyway, for Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus specifically, there are plenty of aquatic animals which would have served as prey in both the Baharia and Alphos formations. One of the most famous being the giant sawfish Oncopristus, as there is actual evidence of a predator-prey re relationship between Oncopristus and Spinosaurus. Other possible prey include the giant coelacanth Mawsonia, Bawitius, Squalocorax, Paranogmius, Ceratodus, and even an unnamed plesiosaur. Spino and Sigil may have competed with each other for food, although they may have also lived in separate formations, and they also coexisted with other fish eaters like Stomatosuchus, Laganosuchus, and Aegisuchus, although the larger size of the dinosaurs would have given them an advantage over the crocs. North Africa during the mid Cretaceous was much, much different than it is now. Less deserts and pyramids and more swamps and river del deltas. Probably the closest modern equivalent to the environment here would have been the Florida Everglades. As stated before, North Africa was basically a paradise for fish. So much so that in sites like Baharia and Kemkem, fish are the most common vertebrates. This, of course, made it perfect for Spinosaurs like Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus, which heavily relied on these fish for food. Crocodilomorphs are also common, with Baharia having Aegyptosuchus, Libicosuchus, and Somatosuchus, Kemkem having Aegisuchus, Eriripasuchus, Elosuchus, Homotosuchus, Kemkemia, and Laganosuchus, and Atkar has Laganosuchus and Coprosuchus. Dinosaurs, ironically, are probably the rarest vertebrates found at these sites, and it isn't uncommon for the carnivores to greatly outnumber the herbivores. Leaning, leading many paleontologists to believe that niche partitioning helped prevent competition between the predators. Baharia had titanosaurs like Paralotitan and Aegyptosaurus, and for theropods it had the famous Carcharodontosaurus, Bahariosaurus, a mysterious theropod which may be a giant Megaraptoran or even a Chimera with the, you know, incompletely invalid, and maybe even a Noasaurid of some sort. Kemkem -Kem was a bit more diverse in terms of dinosaurs, 
having Carcharodontosaurus again, Sauroniops, Robachosaurus, whatever the heck Deltadromius is, a giant abelosaurid, and maybe even a dromaeosaur based on some tooth remains. Atkar had far less dinosaurs, the only ones of note being the abelosaurid Rugops and another species of Carcharodontosaurus. Chemchem also has pterosaurs, mainly Alanca, Cyrocopteryx, and Coloborhynchus, as well as remains of possible Pteranodontids, Sungaripteroids, and Tapajarids. So yeah, Northern Africa was definitely an interesting place during the mid-Cretaceous. Too bad it sucks at preserving fossils, so we're stuck trying to figure out the whole Spinosaurus, Sigilmosasaurus mess again and again. For the behavior section, I'll be I'll focus on four main topics regarding Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus. The purpose of the sale, their semi-aquatic lifestyle, hunting method, and reproduction. First, the sale. Spinosaurus is the only one of the two that is confirmed to possess a sail on its back, but this information could definitely apply to Sigilmosasaurus as well. Ever since it was first unearthed in 1912, the sail and its purpose has baffled paleontologists, and as such, many theorists have come up trying to explain this structure. One theory suggests that the elongated spines don't, don't, didn't actually form a sail, but a hump, similar to modern bison, which would, help, which would help store fat and muscle tissue. Another theory ties the sail to the animal's fish-eating habit, suggesting that like certain birds do today with their wings, Spinosaurus would have used its sail to cast shadows in the water, drawing fish towards the darkness so it can strike. However, there are two theories which tend to prevail over all others, and they're both classics not only for Spinosaurus, but other prehistoric animals with weird crests or sails or other weird structures. There's the theory that the spines would have been covered in blood-rich skin, through which heat would easily be able to escape or enter based on the animal's te body temperature. This is a common theory, as it has been used to explain the sale of a similar but unrelated animal, Dimetrodon, and since African elephants use their giant ears for a similar purpose, it isn't too far-fetched. Finally, there is the classic display theory, which suggests that the sail would have been used to show off to members of the opposite sex and repel rivals. This does tie closely with the air conditioner theory, as an abundance of blood vessels would allow the Spinosaurus to flush its sail with blood, which would help give it much brighter coloration. It would also allow the sail to have, pat uh, have complicated patterns on the skin, which would help make the sail more eye-catching and visually appealing. Personally, I would go with a combination of these theories, as most structures uh, animals like this typically have more than one purpose, so I'm going to go with a combination of the temperature regulation theory and the display theory, and as an added bonus, the sail may have also helped ward off potential predators by making it appear bigger than it already is. Next, how aquatic were Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus? What sounds like a really simple question to answer is much more complicated than you might think. Once a 2014 study hit the scene, many paleontologists believed that Spino and Sigil would have spent much of their lives under or near water, often hunting in the water like crocodiles. However, a study in 2018 which compared the buoyancy of different theropods concluded that Spinosaurus would have been unable to submerge, meaning its swimming capabilities would have been restricted to floating along the surface of the water although this may change if another study is done. How Spinal and Sigil hunted is thankfully much more well fleshed out. The discovery of pets at the end of a Spinosaur snout, similar to that of crocodiles, suggests that Spinosaurs likely had sensory pets at the end of their snouts, which could detect vibrations in the water associated with movement. Thus, most renditions of spinal hunting consist of it either in or by the water, dipping its mouth into the water, 
and waiting until a fish swam, swims between its massive jaws. Planet Dinosaur pretty much has a perfect depiction of this method, and while it's not very visually appealing, it was no doubt very effective. Another method is pretty much the same thing, ex except instead of leaving its snout in the water, the spino would rear its neck back like a pelican and strike when it spots a fish. A study regarding Pseudomosasaurus has even suggested that indeed Spinosaurus may, Spinosaurus may have had specially, highly specialized neck muscles for rapidly striking at prey, similar to that of modern birds and crocodiles. Finally, I'll talk very briefly about Spinosaur reproduction. So far, we only have one baby Spinosaur specimen, and it's only a finger bone, so we don't really know exactly what Spino babies would have looked like, although that hasn't stopped people from guessing. Based on the bone we have, baby Spinos seem to have been just as aquatic as the adults, suggesting that Spinosaurs, or at least the derived ones like Spinosaurus and Cigomasasaurus, may have been able to take care of themselves at a very young age. I've always liked the possibility that Spinosaurs were a lot like crocodiles and alligators in terms of how they raised their young, but for now, that's merely speculation. Unfortunately, like all animals do eventually, Spinosaurus and Pseudomosasaurus eventually went extinct. Thankfully though, how they went extinct is much easier to figure out than for the previous animals I've covered in this series. As both genera disappeared from the fossil record near the end of the Cenomanian, about 94 to 93 million years ago. During this time, we have there's evidence suggests that the world was getting hotter, which rate which would raise sea levels, which in turn caused the swamps that these animals called home to disappear. With their food source going extinct and their way of life disappearing, Spinosaurus and Cigomasasaurus found themselves too specialized to adapt to the changing environment, and they both perished. A lot of other animals also suffered from this changing climate, and while it wasn't a full-fledged extinction event, many of Earth's ecosystems, both on land and in the sea, were drastically altered as a result of this climate change. Spinosaurus and Cigomasasaurus are both commonly considered the last of their kind, although some scant fossil remains suggest the story of the Spinosaurus may not have ended 93 million years ago like originally thought, as there is the supposed Campanian Age tooth I mentioned earlier, as well as another tooth from China believed to date to the Santonian about 86 to 83 million years ago. However, even as Spinosaurus as a whole lived on, Spinosaurus and Sigilmosasaurus likely did not. While Spinosaurus has made lots of appearances in pop culture, Sigilmosasaurus has made zero appearances in any documentary, film, or really any piece of media that I know of. Although you could argue that some of Spinosaurus' appearances in documentaries and such could actually be Sigilmosasaurus. Again, it's complicated. Spinosaurus is one of the most commonly depicted theropods in pop culture, despite how little we know about it, that it would take way too much time to list them all, so I'll cover the more notable appearances. Probably Spino's most iconic appearance in film was in Jurassic Park 3, where it was the main antagonist and controversially killed a T-Rex as well as the multitude of games related to the Jurassic Park franchise, which pretty much all used the design from JP3, which to be fair was pretty accurate at the time the movie was made, but the design just looks out of place in recent releases like Jurassic World Evolution. There's also the Abomination from Monsters Resurrected. Trust me, I will cover this series much more in depth once I finish analyzing Jurassic Fight Club. Other terribly inaccurate designs include the ones from Primeval and Jurassic the Hunted, while other inaccurate designs like the ones in Warpath Jurassic Park, Bizarre Dinosaurs, Primal Carnage, Spin Dinosaur King, 
Dinosaur Train, Zook Tycoon, Dino Dan, and Land Before Time are more outdated than Awesome Bro. The only program as of yet to depict Spinosaurus with the new post-2014 appearance is the Nova special Bigger Than T-Rex. Although Planet Dinosaurs Spinosaurus is very close since the show was made just before the study. There's also Ark, which definitely tried to update its Spinosaurus to the new version, but with the fully quadrupedal stance, it really just looks more like an overgrown Dimetrodon with a weird croc snout than a Spinosaurus. The main problem I have with the Ark design is the front limbs. Even if Spinosaurus was quadru quadrupedal, it would not be able to pronate its wrists to have its hands in that position. It would be walking on its knuckles like a gorilla. Besides that though, Arc Spinal looks pretty good, so I'm not going to complain about it too much. Overall, Spinosaurus's depictions in pop culture are definitely a mixed bag, mostly filled with shit, but there are also some gems hidden in there as well. All I want is in the future is more accurate Spino designs and for poor Sijomasasaurus to be given the spotlight for once. It really shouldn't be that hard since well, you probably just have to tweak the model then call it by a different name. That's all for today. This video was quite a roller coaster to write and research for. And I have to say this is probably my best profile yet, or at least the most thorough. Next up should be the part one of the natural history of Ceratosauria, which will focus on Noasauridae and Ceratosauridae. And after that, I will return to Jurassic Fight Club with an analysis of Raptor's Last Stand. None of the art featured in this video is mine, so be sure to check out the description below to find all the artists and check out more of their work. Thank you all for watching, I hope you learned something new today, and as always, this is PaleoNerd, signing out.